pray and enjoy God's Word. Father, we thank you, we praise you. It is so good to just come and have some fun in the midst of celebrating you, our God, our Father, the one who will never leave us or forsake us. You are our God and our King. Uh, would you help us to refocus our minds, our heart, our attention towards you? Um, would you convict us where conviction is required? Would you encourage us where encouragement is needed? Would you give us great joy? Would this word get deep within our hearts, and would we apply it in our everyday lives? In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So I'm going to preach this message a little different than I did the first service. God's laid some things on my heart, even in the midst of sharing it, that I, I hope will just turn out to be something that will impact all of us. Um, you know, I believe with all of my heart that God created each of you and myself with a purpose in mind. He loves us dearly, and he wants to equip us to fulfill our God-given purposes. You are amazing in him, and he created you to do something great. Some of you can receive that message. You're like, yes, this is awesome. Others of you might be having a little trouble receiving that message. You're like, man, I, I don't know, Eric. I don't know what you're talking about. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I can't um, feel like I can make it a present day reality in my life. I'm just doing everything I can to survive. I'm doing everything that I can to get by. Well, hopefully today we'll learn a few things that'll help us live up to our full potential in him to help us discover our unique gifting in him and what he wants us to do with our lives. And I want to tell you that we all need to be equipped. We all need to gain wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of how God wants to use us. It's one of the most important things that we need to discover in life. There's many great and joyful moments for us as human beings. Some of the highlights for many of us were maybe like the day that we got married. That was an awesome, awesome day. Or the day that you had a baby and you got to experience that new birth coming into life. Um, yours might be different than what mine is. But I can tell you one of the things that brings you great joy for a lifetime is when you figure out and discern your God-given purpose and you begin to walk in it. When you do that, it can bring you joy year after year after year as you know you're doing exactly what God created you to do. Now, there's a lot of good things that you could do in life, right? Your job is a good and important thing. Your family is a good and important thing. Those are important things that we need to grow in and sow into. But your God-given purpose is something that will last from this life and into eternity. Amen, amen, and amen. Let me share with you, first and foremost, as a believer in Jesus Christ, it has something to do with the Great Commission. Your calling in this life has something to do with being a disciple who makes disciples, a disciple who shares their faith. That is part of the calling on each and every believer's life. It says in Matthew 28, 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. What that really is fundamentally is a call to make disciples, not excuses, like our shirt said a couple of weeks ago. That's the call in our life. But the devil does everything he can to thwart us from being able to understand that, from being able to discern it and apply it in our lives, from being able to live it out. So one of the tools that he's really used very well is that last part of that statement where it says, I will never leave you or forsake you. He's created this day and age in which we live in that more often than not is a fatherless generation, right? Many of you didn't grow up with a good father figure in the house or a father at all. And it's one of the great things that we as Christians have an opportunity to help remediate as we understand who God is and how he wants us to live our lives and how he's changed our lives. We can be fathers in the natural, but we can also be spiritual fathers and mothers for other people, helping show them the way to health and life and meaning and the joy and fulfillment of life. See, I never had the opportunity to meet my real dad until I was 40 years old. And I didn't think that that had much to do with many of the ways that I live. I didn't think initially that that maybe stunted my growth. But the more I began to think about it, a lot of what I did in life was to kind of make up for that, trying to overcome some of those limitations of not having a daddy who loved me. First and foremost, how can I trust in a God who would tell me he would never leave me and forsake me if I have an earthly father who did just that? 
So why do you think the devil wants to do everything he can to destroy families? Because he doesn't want us to trust in a heavenly father, and he figures that if he could jack up our families here in the natural, then guess what? We won't trust God the Father in heavenly places that loves us and cares for us is one of the big things that he certainly wants to do. It's one of his biggest tactics, is it not? How do we trust God if we can't trust the other men and women and leaders in our life? Because much of what life sadly teaches us is that everybody's going to leave you. Is that not true? Our friends leave us. Our friends stab us in the back. Our family members do. Relationships happen. All kinds of bad stuff. We've all fell victim to that. And sometimes we've been the one who's done just that. So as a child, when I also try to hear, not just you'll never leave me or forsake me, but man, I am a masterpiece created in God's image, created to do great things, that God's got a purpose and a plan for my life, that's not something that I could see or envision or realize as a young man. I I could barely even tie my shoes. I remember at age five being embarrassed because I was in school and my mom did everything that she could to put pot pies on the table. Come on, Jesus, right? I mean, she did everything she could as a single mom, 20 years old, trying to raise me, trying to do right. And, uh, you know, there's just some things that moms can't do that dads are supposed to be there for. And many of you are super moms. Praise God. You are a lot of super moms in the house that live as single moms and go out there and try to fulfill both of those roles. Praise be to you. May we come alongside of you. May we help you. But there's something about not having a dad there that you feel inadequate. You don't feel that you can fulfill your God-given dreams or destinies in life because, you know, how can you? There's nobody telling you that. There's nobody there to encourage you that. Sure, there's certain surrogate fathers that come along along the way. In my case, most of them were not believers, especially in those early days. There were people like my grandpa Ted who came alongside and tried to fulfill some of that role and love on me and care for me. Thankfully, my mom remarried when I was 13 years old, and uh, I got a man in my life who had some of his act together and was able to sew many of the things in, but a lot of the damage was already done. Even at age 13, a lot of my young life I'd already experienced, so there's a lot of things that I just couldn't see or have the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to discern. So when you start to talk to me about leaving a legacy or how I could live differently and try to instill great values in my own children, all that stuff was so foreign to me in this life. Maybe it's not to you, but it was to me. How can I fulfill a vision like this? How can I do something great for God? It's it's impossible. How could I even begin to think that way? Am I talking to myself in here today, or can some people relate to what I'm saying? So there came a day where I walked into a church much like this, and I didn't want to go because I didn't trust in God. How could I trust in a heavenly father when I didn't have an earthly father? So we showed up on Mother's Day and then shortly thereafter to try to really appease Mary Jo's mom who had invited us to church. But we got there and they were singing songs much like they did today. And all of a sudden, I started hearing about this good, good father, this amazing God who loves me. And somehow, even in the midst of all of that mess, God had a way of beginning to penetrate down into my heart. And I was like, wait a second, can I really trust this God? Can I surrender my life to him and he'll guide me and direct me and he'll forgive me for all the jacked up stuff that I've been doing and have done. There's no reason God should want to do anything with me. I knew I was messed up. I knew that I had issues, yet these people in this room were telling me that there was a God who still loved me in spite of myself. I had trouble believing that at first, but then God did something supernatural in my heart. It says that there's nothing within the heart of man that seeks after God until the Holy Spirit touches us and begins to ignite our hearts and transform our old dead spirits into something that can now be alive. So that day, I ended up running up to the front and surrendering my life to Jesus. And Mary Jo came shortly thereafter me. I heard all this stuff and I believed it for the first time. I couldn't understand it yet. But then thanks be to God, there were some wonderful men in that church who began to come alongside of me. And I said, you know, I didn't know anything, but something had changed in my heart where I wanted to start to learn. And all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, what's next? I got saved, now what do I do? Come on, Jesus. You know, I, I didn't know anything. Everything I knew had to do with drugs and friends and and partying and drinking and trying to be a dad when I didn't know it to be a dad. I didn't know anything about what it meant to be a believer in Jesus Christ. 
And there were some men that came alongside of me and began to show me the way. There was a couple that sat a few rows behind us and they saw us when we gave our life to the Lord. And thanks be to God, they initiated and reached out to us and said, hey, would you join us in our small group? Would you come hang out with us? We'll help you to meet some new people and we'll begin to tell you what this Christian life is all about. They were more mature in their faith and they were willing to reach out to somebody who was a little bit less mature in their faith and say, hey, we're here to help you. We're here to guide you. And I was like, wow, this is cool. And I was a little nervous and I was a little apprehensive, but something needed to change inside of us where instead of staying home on a Wednesday night, as an example, we needed to get up and be brave enough to go to somebody's house that we didn't know. But thank God we did because when we showed up, they started loving on us. They started showing us what it meant to be Christian parents. They started telling us about things like, hey, you really need to go to the foundations of the faith class because it's a great next step where you can begin to learn what it means to be a Christian and what Christianity is all about. Hey, you need to learn more about your marriage. There's this marriage conference that's coming up and you need to go to that marriage conference where you'll learn how to raise your kids, where you'll learn what it means to be a husband and wife. All this stuff was foreign to us, and maybe it is to you too. Maybe you're new to Christianity, or maybe you've been around Christianity for a long time, and you know a lot of the basics, but for some reason, you're still just getting by. I want to tell you a story about Elijah and Elisha today that hopefully will transform your faith, that will ignite your heart, that will show you some of the ingredients that can help you go from living an ordinary Christian night life to an extraordinary Christian life, to a life where you're applying God's word, where you're growing in God's word, where you're witnessing miracles, both large and small, and you're standing in wonder and awe instead of getting beat up by the world, because that's all the world wants to do, doesn't it? It wants to keep you just barely getting by. It wants you to keep you running the rat race. It wants to keep you from your calling and your destiny. It wants to keep you from trusting in God. Well, I'm here to tell you, you do have a God who loves you and cares for you. And he wants to put some people in your life if you are willing to allow them in who will help you grow. And in turn, he wants you to be brave enough to do that for some other people as well. Do you believe me? Do you believe me? A few of you are shaking your heads. Maybe you don't believe me just yet. But I'm here to tell you that if you're living your life on the sidelines and you're not fully engaged in your faith, if you're not growing, if you're not in the battle, if you're not plugged in, that is not God's plan for you. He didn't create you to be on the sidelines. He created you with a purpose, as a masterpiece, with a plan in mind for you to advance the kingdom of God. And it has something to do with the brotherly and sister relationships that we have in this life that helps spur us on. I'm going to mess up the AV team completely, but I'm going to ask you to jump all the way to 2 Kings 2.1. It's probably two or three scriptures up. And I want to tell you for just a second, Elijah and Elisha, 2 Kings 2.1. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, we learned about Elijah last week, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal, and Elijah said to Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. Sounds a little bit like what we read in the Great Commission, right? But in reverse this time, Elijah is the mentor. Elisha is saying, I'm going to be faithful. I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to be there till the end. I want to learn. I want to grow. I want what you have. See, I think all too often in Christianity, we're all too quick to jump from one place to another to abandon the relationships that we have. We don't dig deep roots. If you want to grow tall, if you want to go strong, if you want to bear fruit, you got to put roots down somewhere. You got to go deep. You got to let them sink in. You got to trust that, yeah, you're going to open yourself up to relationships and sometimes you're going to get stabbed in the back, but when you overcome that, you're going to be even stronger in Jesus' name. So they went down to Bethel, and the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. So his mentor is about to be gone. Has he learned everything he needs to learn from him? He stayed with him till the end. How amazing is that? 
Don't abandon the God-given relationships that he puts in your path. Allow him to use those to help advance your life. Plug in. Go deep. Don't be fickle. Don't float around. Go deep in your faith and in the relationships that God puts in your path. He won't leave him. He's going to continue to learn. He's going to grow up. The reverse is true in our lives as well. If you are a mentor and you're mentoring someone else, man, continue to sow into their lives. Don't leave people, spiritual orphans behind you. Allow God to use you and love on them with everything that you have within you. Then this cool things happen, this double portion kind of a relationship. 2 Kings 2.9. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I'm taken from you. And Elisha said, please let there be a double portion of your spirit upon me. And he said, you have asked a very hard thing. And if you see me as I'm being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so for you. So he's saying as the mentor to the mentee, if you hang around to the end, if you're there till I get taken home, if you don't give up early, then guess what? You are going to get a double portion of what God has placed on my life, and he sure did. And they still went on and talked, and behold, chariots of fire and horses separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven, and Elisha saw it, and he cried, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen, and he saw him no more. He took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces, and he took up the cloak that Elijah had and had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen on him, and he struck the water, saying, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. So he takes this cloak, the mantle of the anointing that was on Elijah's life, and uh, maybe in two ways. One, he's mourning. Obviously, he's mourning this loss. Elijah had come to the end, one of the only people or the very few people in the Bible who didn't die. He actually gets caught up in a whirlwind and goes to heaven, right? They say he'll be one of the two witnesses that comes back in the end days and will be prophesying and speaking outside of uh, the gates of Jerusalem at some day, maybe in the very near future where all of us will get to see it, right? So Elisha's there. He stays with him till the very end. He grabs the cloak and then the, the kind of the thing, I, I think he ends up taking the cloak and slamming it on the water because he's like, I wonder if I got that double portion. <laughs> Even in this, you know, do I got the? So he slams it on the water, and the water parts. The sea actually parts, and he walks across just like Moses did. That same kind of anointing passed down from one to the other. So how do you get that kind of anointing? How do you get that kind of wisdom? How do you get that kind of understanding that you can apply in our lives? We have to be open to being in discipling relationships with other people. So what do I mean by that? Right now, if I ask, who in your life is sowing into your life spiritually? How many of you have someone, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but you have someone that you really say is a spiritual mother or father for you? I bet you if we raised hands, very few of you would actually raise your hands, which is the scary thing to me, which is the part that hurts my heart. We see people come into our office all the time looking for advice from Mary Jo and I. You know, we want to give you the best advice that we could possibly give you. We want to love on you, but there's only two of us. You see how many of you there are out there, right? We don't have the ability to do that effectively. All of us need to be engaged in this process of discipling one another, growing one each other up, loving one another, being there for one another, because we could give you some good godly advice, but chances are we can't walk it out with you all the time. We need to open ourselves up to relationships. So what are some of those hindrances? I think we don't trust that other people aren't going to stab us in the back. I think, we don't, I think we believe what the devil says more than what God says. I think that we fear because of all the brokenness of the relationships that we've witnessed that we're afraid to open ourselves up to somebody. So some of the best advice that I got was not in um, church, unfortunately. It was actually in Alcoholics Anonymous. And there's two kind of things that happen there. They have something that they call sponsorship, right? And there's good, godly, awesome sponsors, and then there's sponsees or mentorees, you know, that are there. And kind of what they told me was when I got out of treatment and I needed to go get help, 
I needed to be the one, if I initiated it, it would be even better than if a sponsor initiated it because it showed a willingness in my heart to begin to receive. So they said, Eric, the first meeting that you get into, you need to go in there and you need to raise your hand and you need to say, I need a sponsor. I need help. I don't want to stay where I'm at. I want to change. I want to grow. I want to see something new in my life. And thank God I was able to do that. I walked into a room that day and I was so broken up, I was so busted, I was so disgusted that I had to get to that low place that I was willing to go in and say, I need help. I wish we would all do that much more before we get that low. I wish we would all have the courage to say, hey, I need a mentor in my life. I need somebody in my life that's going to sow into my life, that's going to help me grow. And sometimes, even us introverts, we need to be the ones that initiate that kind of a relationship. If you want to change and you don't want to stay where you're at and you see some people in your spheres of influence that are a little bit further along than you are spiritually, I'm going to pray that you have the boldness to reach out to them and say, Hey, can I hang out with you? Can I learn from you? What would you teach me? What would you help me? How would you guide me? How would you direct me? And then guess what? I have a feeling God is going to do something amazing and start to open up some relationships where that'll begin to happen. And in reverse, or the other side of it being true as well, there's a lot of us that are broken. There's a lot of us that are hurting. There's a lot of us that are more introverted that just don't have the courage to do that. If you're a little bit further along in your faith, and you're a little bit more mature in your faith, would you be like those people that saw Mary, Joe, and I hurting, saw Mary, Joe, and I being new to the faith? Would you tap them on the shoulder and would you say, hey, why don't you come out and have coffee with me? Or why don't you come to my small group? Why don't you come hang out with me just a little bit? Let me tell you a little bit more about what this Christianity is all about and how it's changed my life. Would we, how different would church life be if we were to begin to open ourselves up to those kinds of relationships? How could we squash the head of the devil if we were willing to do that? Amen? I want to encourage you to do just that. Who is your Paul? Who is your Timothy? Dave Ramsey of Financial Peace, he says this. I've heard leadership and relationship coaches say that everyone needs a teacher, a student, and a friend. As Christians, we might tweak that just a little bit to say that everyone needs a Paul, a Timothy, and a Barnabas. So I want you to put yourself in the shoes of Timothy for just a moment. He's a young pastor. He's coming up. He doesn't know much about this life. He doesn't know much about his calling. He doesn't know much about what he's supposed to be doing as a Christian, how to use his gifts. What is this all about? God places a Paul in his life to begin to sow into him, to begin to raise him up, to begin to help him grow. And then what is one of the encouragements that Paul gives to Timothy? He says, don't be shy that you're young in age. God's doing something in your heart in terms of your spirituality. Go share that with somebody else, right? So even if you're a Christian for a very few days, guess what? You can go share your faith with other people. If you're a few steps in front of somebody else, you have something that you can share with them. You could say, I don't know all the theology stuff, and half the time people don't want to hear that part anyways just yet, to be frank with you. All I know is that I was this, and now I'm this, and the only difference is that God came into my life, right? And God will use that to begin to impact the lives of others. So I want to encourage each of us who are here at Journey Church to seek out a mentor and also in turn to be mentoring others. There's many outlets for that to happen. There's these new things that have sprung up kind of organically here at Journey Church called D groups. If someone asks you if you would hang out for them once a, hang out with them once a week and go through this book, I want to encourage you to possibly seize the day. Maybe God's speaking to you and saying, "Hey, this is the time. I need to grow. I need to begin to get mentored in that way." Small groups are another amazing way in which you could do that. If you have the courage like we did that day to get outside of ourselves and turn off the TV or whatever we were going to go do for that particular night and show up at somebody's doorstep, man, your life could be changed forevermore. You could walk through those doors and meet some friends, meet some people that will help you grow, and who knows where God will take you in discovering your God-given gifts, talent, heart, skills, and abilities, how he uniquely crafted you and made you so that you can make a difference in this life, so that you can experience the joy of serving him and living for him all 
all the days of your life, but you got to step out of your comfort zone if you want that to happen. What are some of the other ways God has um, uniquely wired and gifted each of us? If you don't know what you're called to do, I like to call it putting your finger in the, or putting your foot and toes in the shallow end somewhere so that you can begin to learn what it is. So I say this, what do you like to do? What do you like to do? Do you like to sing? Do you like to dance? Do you like to work with kids? Do you like to use electronics? Do you like to talk to other people? Do you like to teach? What is your heart, skill, and ability that God's given you? Because each of you have one that God would want to use to make a difference in the lives of others. There's a story from a famous book in Christian circles called Dog Training, Fly Fishing, and Sharing Christ. Let me tell you just a little about it. It's a funny name for a book, but there was a, a young lady that approached this pastor, and she said, I see all these other people. I see you on stage, and you're getting to speak to all of these people, and you're sharing the good news of your faith, and I, I don't know what to do. I, I, I don't know how to share my faith. I don't know what I'm called to be doing. And he told her, what do you like to do? And she said, what unique gift or hobby do you have? And she said, well, one thing God's given me is um, I know how to train dogs. And he goes, why don't you go and start a dog training group that meets on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m., whatever he might have told her, and you go out there and you teach people how to train dogs. You know a lot of y'all need your dogs trained. Come on, Jesus, right? <laughs> you know, so she went out and was super creative. They used to have the classified section back in those days. Come on, Jesus, newspapers. Some of you remember what those were. She put a classified ad in the paper and said, free dog training lessons on Saturday mornings come out and then she would teach people how to train their dogs. And while she did, they would say, why are you doing this for free? And she would say, because, man, I love God. He gave me this heart to work with dogs. I know how to do it. And then she became one of the biggest evangelists that that church ever had. As people came there, they learned about their dogs. She invited them to come to church. And many, many people came to know Jesus because she used something like that in order to win people to Christ. So the other part of that book, the fly fishing part, what was the beauty of that? There was some, the, the pastor's son was young at that time, and he had taken an interest in fly fishing, but the pastor didn't know anything about it. There was a group of older men who were there that liked to go fly fishing, and they ended up taking the younger son with them in a small group kind of a context, and the son not only learned to fly fish, but he learned from the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of those older men who were there to sow into the lives of that young man. See, this is how it works, Journey. That's why we need people with gray hair and no hair, as well as the youngest among us here at Journey Church, do we not, right? So that we can learn from one another and grow in one another, but it takes these steps of faith to get outside of ourselves, to be willing to commit to relationships that at first we don't believe in because the devil has so beat us down that we can't trust that these things will be beneficial to us. But I want to tell you that God has a purpose, a plan, and a calling in your life that he wants you to live out, and it's one of the most important things you need to discover. He wants to use you to impact the lives of other people. Can you believe that? As jacked up as you are, he wants to use you. Come on, Jesus, right? As jacked up as I am, he wanted to use me. But we can't believe it. Let those words stick in your heart again. Uh, the, if the uh, worship team would please begin to come back up here. Who's your Paul? Who's your Timothy? Who are you allowing in? How are you going to get that double portion? How are you going to walk in it? You know, God actually says things like this in his word in John 14, 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Man, if you believe in him, he wants to use you in this way. He wants to use whatever you might even deem insignificant. Whatever that hobby is, whatever God's placed on your heart, would you step out in faith and begin to use it for God's glory? Would you thank him that you know how to bowl like nobody else knows how to bowl in Jesus' name? 
I mean, whatever that thing is that God's given you, would you allow him to use it? And if you truly want to grow, would you get outside of yourself, outside of your sin, outside of your pain? Would you reach out and tap somebody on the shoulder who God has put as a person of influence in your life? And would you say, hey, could we go to coffee together? Could we hang out for just a moment? I have some questions I'd like to ask you. And in return, if you're at that place where you're strong in your faith and you see some others who are struggling, would you allow God to use you? Would you go tap somebody on the shoulder and say, hey, why don't you come have some coffee with me and allow God to use you to impact their lives as well? Would you rise with me? Bow your heads. Close your eyes for just a second. I'm going to ask you some couple questions and I'll repeat them after the song that we sing together. Are you living up to your full potential and calling in Christ Jesus, or do you just not believe that the stuff I'm talking about is for you? Do you want to experience the joy I was talking about earlier by living out what God has created you for, but you don't know how? Are you going to be a person who makes disciples, or are you going to be a person who makes excuses? So during this next song, I'd like to invite you to Get up out of your seats if you feel so led. Myself and others would be glad to pray for you. If you want to pray by yourself, you're welcome to come up and kneel down at the altars. If you want to take communion by yourself or with your family, communion elements are both to my left and my right. But reflect on those questions as we sing. Allow God to work in your heart. And then when the song comes to an end, we'll all pray together. And then we'll go out and have a wonderful afternoon in Jesus. Let us worship God for a few more moments. life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you It's your bread and our love, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your bread and our love, so we pour out our praise to you only.
for one moment and just contemplate the questions that I asked you earlier and the songs that we just sang and the importance of those good and godly relationships that might surround us to help us reach our full potential. As important as those are, there's one relationship that is essential, and that's a relationship with God the Father through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. Just like I walked through the doors of that church that one day and God began to work on my heart that day, I surrendered my life to Jesus. That was the starting point of that change. That was when everything began to shift and I began to realize what I was created for and who I was created to worship. And man, from that day forward, my life has never been the same. And maybe some of you are here this Father's Day and you don't really trust in the one who we call Father who sent his only begotten son Jesus to die that we might have life, but you feel something tingling in your heart and your spirit. You're like, man, I want to meet him. I want to live for him. I want to surrender my life to him. That's God at work in your heart and in your mind. There's others of you, you are believers, your salvation is secure, but maybe you know that you haven't been walking the right way. You know that you haven't been living for him. His arms are wide open, waiting for you to come home. And man, maybe that's why God brought you through these doors today that you could say, Lord, I'm coming home. So if you're of either of those two groups and today's the day you want to either dedicate or rededicate your life to God, if that's you, I would love to pray for you. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. If that's you, would you show me that by raising your hand so that I know who I'm praying with? If that's you, do that now. Raise your hand. I see your hand. Thank you, ma'am. Is there anybody else here today? It's a little dark. I might not see too good, but if you can, raise your hand up nice and high, and I'll be glad to pray for you. If I missed any, forgive me, but we're going to pray for you right now. Lord, we join with this woman right here on the second row, gladly saying that, Jesus, you are the Son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again. We thank you for coming from heaven to earth to show us the way. We thank you for your words when you said you'll never leave us or forsake us. And when you returned up to heaven, you sent the Holy Spirit as an assurance of our faith. Your blood was shed on Calvary's cross that our sins might be forgiven. Help us to understand that and to realize it and apply it in our lives. The fact that we are forgiven, that we are set free, that we are white as snow, that we don't have to look to the past, but we can look towards the future. And Father, we can't thank you enough for saving us and sending your son that we might have life and we might be part of the family of God for all who are fatherless. We thank you, oh God, that you are our good, good Father, we love you with all our heart, strength, soul, and mind, and we dedicate our lives to you this morning. There's another group I'd love to pray for before we go. I asked a few questions. Are you living up to your full potential and calling? Are you experiencing the joy from living this Christian life, or are you just getting by? Do you have that mentor that I was talking about in your life, are you willing to begin to open up to that? Are you willing to maybe get outside of your comfort zone and ask for some help? I'm not going to call you up to the front. And I would ask that nobody looks around, but I would ask if that's you and you know that you need God to help you break through in some of these areas that I've been mentioning, would you do me a favor and just raise your hand up? So I'd love to pray for you right where you're at. I see hands literally all over the room today. Lord, I pray this message has lasting impact that you would touch the hearts and the minds of all who are here, that you would use this as a moment of transformation, even within Journey Church, where we would be a people who really seek out those Paul, Timothy, Barnabas kind of relationships, 
where we're looking at the lives of others of who we might sow into while in turn we're always looking to grow by seeking out those as well who you've put before us and a little bit further ahead in their faith that they would sow into us. Lord, give us the boldness to open ourselves up to those kinds of relationships. Even if we've been burned in the past, would today be that kind of a day? Would we hear stories of people shoulder tapping others in both directions saying, would you help me or can I help you, Lord God? Would you just do something impactful and mighty as we grow up in you together to be grown-ups in the faith? Lord, would you move on us with that special kind of anointing because we don't want to miss out on what Elisha experienced from that deep-rooted relationship with Elijah. Lord, we don't want to try to go at it on our own. We don't want to be discipled by some TV evangelist, Lord God. We want to be discipled by real, loving, caring relationships with other brothers and sisters in the faith who would just sow into our lives and in turn would that become an overflow that we pour out as well into the lives of others. We believe that these relationships are essential and vital. Would you help us overcome any fears that we have that we might apply them into our everyday lives in Jesus' mighty and glorious name. Would you put your hands together and say, Say amen, amen, and amen. Let me leave you with just a couple of tangible next steps. Man, if you're not in a small group, I encourage you, pull up that app, find a group. The summer groups are meeting right now. Would you plug into a group and become a part of a group and let God use that group to help you make some new friends, to help break down barriers, to help take down those walls that you could connect with some other people and begin to take your walk of faith to the next level. If you need help finding a group, they have some printed directories over there at the next steps. Go over there and ask them as well. I know they'd be willing to help you. Start to serve. Plug into a serve team. I'm telling you, what a great way to begin to use your heart, skills, and abilities to make a difference for God. Meet some new friends and help advance the kingdom of God as well. Have a wonderful day.